The mission that guides the Fenway Sports Group's chief financial officer is the same simple principle that drives each and every player on the Boston Red Sox, the Pittsburgh Penguins, and the Liverpool Football Club. Winning's at the core of everything we do here. The scoreboard tells the results. The balance sheet lays the foundation. The balance sheet is so important to the success of the team. With financial integrity, success will come. But any sports fan can tell you it's not that simple. Alongside cash flow, there's a flow of emotion, tradition, and generations of expectations. Decisions CFO Julie Swinehart makes today will resonate for decades, as Red Sox CEO Sam Kennedy well knows. Capital allocation is the key challenge. What has she brought to that challenge? I, I think Julie brought a discipline uh, to really study potential growth opportunities for us. She understands that when we're deploying resources, the, the first line item mm -hmm. are the teams. The first line item is investing in that product on the field, on the pitch, on the ice to be successful. We are in a business of long-term value creation mm -hmm. for our partnership, not a quarter by quarter cash flow projection. Frame out the internal rate of return study. There's the model in the CFA Institute work of seven years, terminal value, maybe it's short-termism of three years. And then there's the emotion of Pittsburgh, Liverpool, and Boston. Is your internal rate of return study 50 years? The returns that we see might be short-term and some are long-term. And what I've found so far is there's elements of that kind of computational return math, if you will. But as you alluded to, there's so much more to it. You have to be aware of the intangibles. It's a nice blend that's not so academic and strictly academic. I think you'd lose if you just focus there. One year since joining Fenway Sports Group, Julie Swinehart's still honing her focus, bringing her expertise to an iconic company. It is a newly created role. It is under a fierce spotlight. Julie has a tremendous amount of pressure because we've had success here. We, we need to keep it going. She brings leadership, experience, uh, passion for the industry. Um, and we've never had a CFO at the parent company level. I'm used to rigor and controls and uh, a cadence of financial reporting and kind of enhanced nuts and bolts of a process. I have to appreciate that this group has been highly successful in the model that they have. They're very entrepreneurial, innovative group of people, very smart, very talented. And me coming in with a heavy hand saying, this is how we need to do things is, is certainly not my style. I quickly try to assess what's working and let's continue to support those things. Try to assess what's not working, what, what could be improved right. and try to add value there. But I do it in a way that starts with relationship building. When John Henry and Tom Werner bought the Boston Red Sox in 2002, the word Fenway referred to a decaying ballpark housing a beloved but bedraggled baseball franchise. What happened next was unprecedented. The courage it took for John Henry and Tom Werner to say, not only are we gonna save Fenway, but we're gonna invest hundreds of millions of dollars into it um, was a really big deal back in 2002. And 22 years later, we're still here, and this jewel has been preserved. The first Red Sox World Series title in 86 years turbocharged the turnaround. The Boston Red Sox are world champions. The Fenway brand was suddenly golden, and led by Henry, Werner, and Mike Gordon, it grew. Over two decades, it has become a $10 billion global business. Part of Fenway Sports Group's secret sauce is investing in blue chip sports assets that our fans care deeply about so we can win on the field, on the ice, on the pitch, uh, but also invest in their venues. The beauty of Fenway Sports Group is, is we, we feel we can do it all. That's where Julie Swinehart comes in. What is the strategy to move this success to the next level? We have distinct management teams throughout each entity. So the Red Sox have a CEO and a CFO. Liverpool has right. a CEO and CFO. 
And those folks are, are, are offered a fair bit of autonomy and decision-making decision, decision -making authority. Right. Part of my role is to make sure that we continue to maintain access to capital, uh, keep our cost of capital as low as it can be, fortify the balance sheet so that we can go and, right. and, and seek out that new team in an existing league or perhaps dive into a new venture and a, and a new type of sport. We are in growth mode. FSG has been in growth mode all along. It kicked up a notch in 2021 when Jerry Cardinale's Redbird Capital took an 11% equity stake. Months later, the group bought the NHL Pittsburgh Penguins. They're on the lookout to expand further. As long as the growth opportunities fit our overarching criteria, which are blue chip in nature, uh, great opportunities to either restore, rebuild, or enhance a venue uh, that might need some TLC, and we feel that the Fenway Sports Group can be additive and, and, and create more value given our expertise, it's something we'll look at. What we do at Fenway Sports Group when it comes to M&A in particular, we have a, call it a five-person committee that takes ideas from our, that come from our chief strategy officer and his team. The five of us digest it, analyze it. Uh, there's times where I'm playing devil's advocate to make mm -hmm. sure that we're not just getting too excited or too emotional about an idea. And then the group of five uh, right. vote. And then ultimately that information is provided to ownership. So John Henry, Tom Werner and Mike Gordon are the ultimate decision makers when it comes to new investments. Meanwhile, franchise prices keep setting records. There are no bargains to be found in the NFL or NBA, but at least those leagues have salary caps. In European soccer, the price of entry is just as high. Financial controls are weak, petrodollars are pouring in. It's enough to give a CFO migraines. How do you at FSG compete with these huge blocks of money? It is, uh, it is something that's top of mind for us. It is becoming more competitive. I think we try to um, you know, do more with, with what's there. These clubs, these franchises, they need massive investment. Are we disciplined? Do we try to be disciplined? Uh, yes, of course, because we need uh, to spend at, at the player development area, uh, on free agents, on transfers when it comes to global football. Discipline is the watchword also flexibility. I'll tell you a, a little story about Liverpool. We started uh, looking at the club in August of 2010. Um, an email was sent from a passionate LFC supporter who worked in our sponsorship department. Three months later, we own the club. Um, so you in 90 days, <laughs> you turn that around in 90 days. True story. Wow. So uh, while there's nothing on paper, there's no strategic plan right now to go out uh, and acquire a new franchise or a new venue, mm -hmm. things can happen rapidly around here. Fenway Sports Group teams consistently rank near the top of their leagues in player salaries. The Red Sox have won four championships on FSG's watch. Liverpool brought home its first league title in 30 years. Still, spending can't guarantee victories. How do you save money, save capital, save emotion for that rainy day when you're not winning? How do you budget that for a year? There are things that we can do that are irrespective of winning or losing. And that's mm -hmm. look at today's interest rate environment. How can we uh, perhaps institute some techniques and tools to lower right. interest rates? How can we uh, take a look at the, the first budget that comes from one of the teams and ask questions about do you really need to spend that much? Are you really shooting high enough when it comes to partnership revenue? On the revenue side, Fenway Sports Management sells sponsorships across the portfolio. They've brought some major brands on board. The challenge is finding places to put all the labels. These teams look under every rock and it's everything from, from league patch, from jersey patches to um, space around the field. To, Nesson has digital ad insertion now in, in their DTC product. But it's also how can we expand our stadiums and our, and our arenas into uh, more revenue generating space. We've done that recently at Fenway. We've done, we're doing it right now over at Anfield and, and at PPG Paints Arena in Pittsburgh. 
That brings us full circle to FSG's original masterstroke, unlocking the value in venues. Now they're reimagining entire neighborhoods. The vision for the Fenway neighborhood, Fenway 3.0 as we call it, is to continue to establish this as a place where people want to live, where they want to work, where they want to play. What's the biggest challenge of FSG working with Julie to move forward sequentially on a real estate project? It's a great question. Julie uh, and others will, will be studying the viability of each of these projects to make sure uh, that there's the market. We know we're challenged right now with all, the office market is mm -hmm. under uh, duress because of COVID. There's an old saying in baseball, if you build it, they will come. We need to make sure if we build here in the Fenway neighborhood, they will come. Preserving what's here, but also enhancing it or elevating to it to make it better is what FSG is all about. You need to time it well with the market. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to partner with the community, but there's certainly potential for additional revenue generation. Can you do it in Liverpool? <laughs> yeah, you can do it in Liverpool. If, if you have the right mix, you have to recognize all these markets are different. Certainly what works in Boston may not work in mm -hmm. Pittsburgh or, or Liverpool. So Julie's going to be tasked with going into each of these markets mm -hmm. and seeing what real estate development in those markets uh, is acceptable right. and makes sense for that particular neighborhood. Coming up, Julie Swinart takes me on a stroll around the Fenway neighborhood and gives me a glimpse of the future. This is going to become the true entrance to Fenway Park. This is Bloomberg. Some of the greatest stars in history have worn the uniform of teams that now play under the banner of Fenway Sports Group. Fenway Sports CFO Julie Swinehart sported Bears colors while growing up outside Chicago and also played some soccer. But the budding athlete found her true calling as a mathlete. Were you so nerdy that you were excited about an HP 12C? <laughs> Did you get a Hewlett Packard calculator like I have and you were doing you are cash talking... flow analysis on it? I don't know if you knew, but you are talking to someone who went downstate for the calculator competition of math team in high school. One of my best, my best kept secrets, which is now no longer a secret. After studying accounting at the University of Illinois, she landed jobs at Arthur Anderson and then Deloitte. She then took her talents to real estate ultimately becoming CFO of a publicly traded retail REIT. Nothing in her professional resume suggested she'd end up getting a call to big league sports. You parachute in a nerdy accountant from the Midwest <laughs> and say, help us, what did you need before you brought in Julie Swinehart? Uh, I think we needed some adult supervision. Julie was just what the doctor ordered. She had incredible experience in the public markets and what I'll call real business in the real estate world. Mm -hmm. um, and bringing her into the toy department of life of professional sports um, and media and real estate was just the perfect fit. Of course, even supervising adults get to have fun at the office when the office is Fenway Park. Do you do the wave? I absolutely get involved in you the wave. You get involved in the Every wave. Every time. Every time. It's part of being here. So I you, sing Sweet I, Caroline. I'm, I sing the, I do it all. You, you sing Sweet Caroline when you're here. This is, most CFOs don't do this. Well, I got to dive in. Got to be part of it. Julie Swinehart is supremely skilled at navigating the rapids of real estate. That's important because real estate development is the next frontier in the business of sports. Teams are building outward from their ballparks with budgets in the billions. Fenway Sports Group has a blockbuster project in the works. We are envisioning two million square feet. We have, we have five acres to play with here. And when all is said and done, we expect two million square feet across residential, commercial, retail. 
Given the track record of Messrs. Henry, Werner, and Gordon, the Fenway Corners plan comes with high hopes of success. That doesn't mean it will be an easy lift, especially right now. What have you learned with the dynamic move of the interest rates that we've seen from Chairman Powell? I mean, do you go fixed structure or floating structure, much more like what they do in Europe? Yes and yes. We, uh, we have a mix currently. Uh, it's a little bit of a different model than, mm -hmm. than what I was used to in the public, co public company space. Say in, in some ways it, we provide ourselves with a natural hedge, leaving some uh, of our debt floating and some fixed. Julie Swinehart took me on a walking tour into the future. This is going to become the true entrance to Fenway Park. And that's part of the attractiveness of this project is the age old recipe of increasing dwell times, bringing fans to the park, right. bringing in businesses, maintaining what's here and preserving right. some of the historic nature of what you see around you, but making it even more accessible, making it more fan friendly. In addition, the buildings that currently house the team store uh, will be transformed into something a little less heavy. Should uh, I get down open. on my knees? This is the best merch store in all of sports isn't it? It's a fantastic store and it's been a great partnership to have the D'Angelo family in their store right here and they're part of the, the project part moving of the forward. Absolutely. Right. FSG says the neighborhood won't become a sports theme park. They won't sweep all the grit away. They've made a promising start with the MGM Music Hall. That venue opened next to Fenway Park in 2022. It fits perfectly into the row of iconic music clubs on Lansdowne Street. It was a project that was many years in the making. Really the first project uh, utilizing the real estate that surrounds Fenway Park. What was the best practice you got out of it? I mean, it's, a, it's an experiment that I would assume there are 40 other ideas out there. What's the key idea from the MGM Hall? We're looking to do something similar in Pittsburgh. And we've got some parcels adjacent to the hockey rink there. And MGM, again, is partnering with us to put something in place that will serve, again, that smaller, more intimate venue uh, adjacent to a great sports venue. Today, Lansdowne Street, tomorrow, the world. What Fenway Sports Group has already done here was unimaginable 25 years ago. Julie Swinehart will have a hand in the next 25. We are behind the architecture that holds the seats behind the famed green monster. What's your next project like this, where you're going, we're not sure this is gonna work, but let's try it. A few come to mind uh, that that we probably haven't shared publicly yet, but well, we, we are can do it right now. we are constantly <laughs> we are constantly trying to assess and evaluate what's the next thing. And a lot of leagues are established. Sure, we'd love to one day have a, a team in an, an already established league in the U.S. or globally. But there's other opportunities that are pretty much right in front of us to leverage technology to create a new uh, a new a new league there's there's one in the making that uh, that tomorrow sports has has begun it's a tech forward golf league and we have made a small investment into that venture coming up Fenway Park used to go dark for half the year these days there is no off season we have a desire to establish Fenway Park as the busiest uh, 365 day a year outdoor venue. And Julie Swinehart tells me what is her biggest headache as CFO of Fenway Sports Group. I constantly think about what I don't know. This is Bloomberg. Fenway Sports Group takes its name from Fenway Park, the venue many thought John Henry and Tom Werner should abandon when they bought the Boston Red Sox. Instead of getting out, they've just kept leaning in. Part of this is getting beyond the season. How do you get 1912 Fenway Park? It was cold and dark for months and months. How do you get it beyond the season to a full year? Winter Classic, for example. Um, Irish hurling, uh, Spartan racing, college football, international soccer. We have a desire to establish Fenway Park as the busiest 
a 365 day a year outdoor venue. It's that kind yeah. of mindset where what yeah. else can we do? We had the busiest off season here at Fenway that we had had in years. Interesting. That means more revenue, of course. It also creates buzz and expands the brand in all directions. The opportunity to have some of these, these non-core activities bring in a new fan base. If you bring in a music act that, that doesn't typically attract a baseball demographic, some percentage of those people attending that concert are probably going to have a good experience, hopefully a large percentage, and they right. might come back for a game when there's an opportunity. Just don't stick with the same old, same old. The same principle led FSG to retool its regional sports network. People aren't subscribing to cable packages to the degree they used to be. So what did we do? We went ahead and supported an initiative to create a direct-to-consumer product. And we were the first to market in the RSN space with Nesson 360. We transmit in right. 4K. My counsel to others would be to try to stay ahead of consumer behavior, ahead of the curve, and invest in areas such as a DTC product. Uh, I do think we are one of the best in the business when it comes to that. Julie Swinehart's expertise in energy are making a best-in-class enterprise even better. I asked her what she sees when she looks ahead. What is the goal for the next five to 10 years? What is your reach for the next five to 10 years? The goal is to keep the good work going. Let's keep growing. Let's continue to invest in the teams and the real estate that where the teams play to make the fan experience amazing and to, and to introduce new generations of fans to these sports that are so important to, to who we are as people. What's the biggest headache you have? I constantly think about what I don't know, and I'm staying curious about what else is out there. What, what's the competition doing? What do they know that we don't know? Uh, and there's ways to go about trying to put those fears to rest. We tap into our networks, we participate in industry events, we uh, try to stay at the forefront of, of data and technology. We try, we try to scout that player that no one else has their eye on, right? That's one way we stay successful. So you're in charge of finding the next shortstop for the I Absolutely Red Sox. not. When I interviewed, I explained, guys, I'm not sure that I'm the best fit for the job. I don't know the players. And they said, don't worry, we've got someone who handles that. The CFO skills always comes back to the four accounting statement. What's the most important line in the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow statement, some discussion of shareholders' equity? Where's the CFO part of that where it really comes home? I am I think it's a, a combination of things. I'm very focused on operating cash flow. I think that's a great metric to look at. And for us, EBITDA. EBITDA combines income statement dynamics and brings over some form of the depreciation and amortization. How do you depreciate that fullback on Liverpool that's so <laughs> wonderful? How do you depreciate that? There's an amortization over a, a useful life. It is a little awkward to talk about players and, and useful lives because it's uh, sure. it's human and, and not uh, a physical asset. Well, there's accounting rules around it and it's uh, not as different from other industries as you'd think. Someone you know calls up and they say, OMG, I'm a CFO. What do you say to them? I say, congratulations, this yeah. is amazing. And my advice to you as a new CFO would be to not feel alone. Realize that you have one singular role, but you've got many teams below you, next to you, and above you. You've got leadership in every direction who are there to support you. And you have to not put too much on yourself, but to leverage the teams and to give people decision-making abilities at the team level. So to me, teamwork is key. Stay curious, ask a lot of questions, and try to sort out what you don't know and then work tirelessly to get better at those things. I'm Tom Keen. This is Bloomberg.